morning, good morning, good morning. Thank you very, very much everybody for coming here. Uh, we'll have a few folks still at the UFFA, but try to get through that and get to your seat so you can start. Barbara Harris is here. Good morning, Barbara. Man. Uh, thank you, thank you for coming this morning, folks. This is terrific. Um, I have a word from the retreat that the lights will stay on as well. You knew I was going to do that more spell stick then, didn't you? Uh, the reason for, well, we thought this was a record-breaking uh, event. We had 95 of you uh, respond that you were going to be here this morning. We haven't counted, but maybe we're pretty close to that. So uh, this is terrific. The turnout is excellent, and we thank you for getting up on early on a Monday morning. But who could not get up early on a Monday morning when you have folks like the folks we have in the room today starring in our show? Uh, I'm going to send you Peter Galbraith and Jeanette White, and Representatives Molly Burke, Brattleboro, Mike Hebert, Wilfred and Vernon. Uh, I don't see if Ann Van Waring is here, but if Ann were here, she would be representing Halifax, Widingham, and Wilmington. Dick Merrick is here from Marlboro, Newfane, and Townsend. I uh, haven't seen Mike Mawicki, from in Putney and Westminster, but he might come in. John Moran's here. Cover, John has the whole sort of long thing, covering parts of both Wyndham and Bennington counties with Dover, Reedsboro, Searsburg, Somerset, Stamford, and Wardsburg. How do you do it? And what? I'm sorry, did I leave that for And a bit of Halifax. And a bit of Halifax. I didn't know there was such a thing as a bit of Halifax. And uh, I haven't seen Carolyn Partridge. She did say she was going to be a maybe this morning, but Carolyn would be representing Athens, or Athens, is it pronounced? Brookline, Grafton, Rockingham, Westminster, and Window, and Valerie Stewart, Bradler. Uh, I have not seen uh, Matt Trieber this morning, who uh, is here. No, no, I haven't seen him. Uh, Matt is, covers the same territory as Carolyn. Uh, Tristan Tolino is here for the first time as a representative. Uh, he's been here many times as just another guy. <laughs> and uh, Tim Goodwin, who took over for Oliver Olson uh, over in um, Jamaica, Londonderry, Stratton, Weston, and Winhall. Uh, I haven't ever met him, but he's here. He's not here with us this morning. Anyway, but to those who are here this morning, starting the show, please thank you very, very much for coming. Um, there are some new people who've never been to a chamber breakfast in the room, I'm sure. And if you are here, and you are new, and you've never been to a chamber breakfast, why don't you get up and say really quick your name and uh, what business you're representing? <laughs> Nobody. There you go. <laughs> John Z. Rock, representing Bradbrook, Wallace, and River Valley Credit Union. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Is that it? Okay. Well, thank you very, very much for uh, for coming this morning. Um, right now, I'm going to take this handheld mic and uh, roam around the room while my colleague, who does the better, the MC thing better than anybody else, uh, takes over for the morning. Jim Hazen former chamber board member and still a driving force on the July Legislative Committee will be your MC this morning. So Jim, take it away. Morning. Um, I want to first thank our sponsors, the Richards Group and the uh, River Valley Credit Union for sponsoring this morning. We'll give them a hand. Legislators here today, so I'm asking that they each limit their comments to three to four minutes max so that we get some time at the end for questions and answers, and we'll be able to get out of here as we usually do at nine o'clock sharp. Um, so, without any further ado, if we can get started, first up on the list is uh, Molly Burke. For some reason, Jerry always makes me go first. Is this mic on? Yes. It's on. Okay. Uh, so, I'm on the Transportation Committee. I represent Brattleboro, for those of you who don't know, one-third of Brattleboro. I'm on the Transportation Committee. And there was a funding study, transportation funding study done this summer uh, to look at, you know, how we fund our transportation system given that the gas tax is down, people are driving more fuel-efficient vehicles, it's all good, but uh, we're not getting the um, money from the gas tax. So, they looked at different long-term solutions how to do that, the committee uh, estimated, and this is 
sobering numbers, and we're going to have like a $240 million gap in our transportation funding every year. So we, uh, while we're looking at this year's transportation bill, we're also looking at how do we solve this problem in the long term. So that's just, uh, and then so for this year, in the short term, uh, we, we found that we have a $36 million gap. In order to not leave $125 million of federal money on the table, we need to match that with $36 million. And the proposal, the governor's proposal to do that, and it's just a proposal at this point, is to, um, we set up a transportation infrastructure bond fund several years ago to uh, a certain portion of the gas tax would go just to transportation projects. And we're going to be bonding about 8.3 million from that fund. That still leaves a, a quite a bit in there, so it's it's not cutting down on our reserves at all. And then we the plan is to decrease the gas tax, the flat gas tax, which is now Vermont tax, which is now 19 cents by 4 and 0.7 cents, and that um, and to replace that with a 4% assessment on the retail sales of gas. And then the other plan is to index the per gallon tax to inflation, which for this year would be revenue neutral. So uh, I'm not going to do the math right now, but that gets us to 36 million. That's something that the Transportation Committee will be discussing and to see whether that is um, the, the uh, way to solve this problem. But we do not want to leave federal money in Washington while our, our roads and bridges need attention. And then one more thing I just want to talk about is that we had a, 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 a several of the committees, the Ag Agricultural Committee, the, um, maybe Tristan was going to talk about this, so I don't want to, uh, the oh, Commerce that. Committee and the um, uh, Natural Resource Committee had heard from uh, a, a variety of businesses this week about the impact of climate change on their businesses. And we heard from maple producers, we heard from the tourism industry, we heard from uh, uh, the ski industry, uh, vineyards, and uh, other businesses that are, are how, how are they impacted, what are they doing about it, talking about mitigation, and also about adapt, adaptation. And I think one of the more sobering statistics was that Mary Powell of Greenmount Power talked about how Greenmount Power has spent $6 million since October on just storm-related repairs, things like that. So, so there's just a lot of a lot of repercussions <coughs> of what's going on and uh, what we're seeing in kind of storm-related Irene events and things like that. So I just wanted to bring that up. That that was, is something that that we were uh, listening to and and maybe Tristan. I don't know if he was going to talk about that. So I'm sorry if I. Anyway, uh, so I think that's all I have to say. I think I've done that in three minutes. And thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Molly. Your comments on uh, schedule. Thank you, Valerie. Okay, well, I'd like to take Molly's two, two additional minutes, maybe. I don't know. I didn't time this, so. I'll, I'll try not to, though. I'll try to do a little Evelyn Wood speed reading first. Keep talking, actually. Anyway, um, uh, let's see. As well, many of you know, I'm Valerie Stewart, and I'm proud to say that this is my second biennium on the House Education Committee. It's great to see all of you here today, and I want to start out by saying how grateful I am to live in this vibrant and tightly knit community. The one and only Brattleboro is such a great tagline because it fits one of the best small towns <coughs> in America. Before I cut to the chase and talk about what we're doing on the House Education Committee, I want to give a big shout out to a handful of people, many of whom are here today for the incredible job they've done strengthening and enlivening our town. First and foremost, I want to thank the one and only Jerry Goldberg for the incredible job he's done working on our community's behalf. Jerry's tireless energy, New York City sophistication and street smarts has been such an asset to our town. Without Jerry, Joining forces with people like Barb Suntag and the Brattleboro Select Board, BAG, the arts community, and many others too numerous to mention, I'm not sure Brattleboro would have survived the catastrophes ranging from the Brooks House fire to Tropical Storm Irene that have plagued us over the past few years. 
Now, with my House Education Committee hat on, I want to give a big shout out to Mas the Masabi Partnership and SEVIS for making the Brattleboro Regional Academic Center a reality. Governor Shumlin gets the credit for having the vision to put that wonderful idea on the table. But the Richards Group, Richards Brothers, uh, Drew and Peter, Craig Miskovich, Ben Taggart and Bob Stevens deserve the credit for having the courage to take the bull by the horns and make the new Consolidated Community College of Vermont and Vermont Technical Center uh, rise from the Brooks House ashes. <coughs> Speaking of that project, it became almost a joke on my committee as I strongly advocated that one of our state's scarcest resources, money, be set aside for what I called the gateway to the South. With a, with a little help from our friends, I don't know if Ann's here yet. Did Ann come? Ann Ann Waring? Well, anyway. Um, with a little help from our friends, Ann Ann Waring, who's on the Appropriations Committee, and our wonderful speaker, Shaq Smith, we squeaked out $2.5 from a very tight budget as startup money for that project. Now, on a different note, I want to say that I agree with the governor that Vermont needs to be the education state and that we need to close the gap between the job creators who have the work and the Vermonters who need jobs. And I agree education is the state's greatest economic development tool. From a policy level perspective, we need to make growing jobs and making sure the state has a skilled workforce to fill them a reality. I don't need to tell any of you the three things we need as a state to be competitive in the global economy. We need improved broadband, and I'm sure Senator Galbraith will say a few words about his pet peeve. He'll hold up his Blackberry. Do you have your Blackberry? Thank you, thank you. iPhone, iPhone. iPhone, sorry, sorry. I can't keep the technology straight. Um, but anyway, um, a more streamlined and less expensive healthcare system and more investment in education. The good news is that on the education front, which is now what I'm gonna focus pretty much solely on, our educational leaders all across the state, from the members of the Vermont National Education Association, the superintendents, the school boards, the principals associations, all agree with the governor. In fact, in his typical style, the governor got the idea from them um, in terms of his priorities. He's a good listener and he really did get his priorities from theirs. But the great thing is all of the stars are now in alignment. Everybody gets it. Everybody knows creating universal early childhood education system and making free lunches available to all low income Vermonters is what we need to do. And I'm happy to say that H60, which we worked on with the Hunger Council of Vermont, has a pretty good possibility of passing in the House. It's not really gonna cost the state any money. I don't know if you guys have read about it. I mean, it's gonna cost a total of a little bit over $600,000. Only 300,000 of that is money that we will, we will take out of our own pockets. The other uh, piece will be a federal drawdown. And um, so it's really, and you know, uh, in early access to pre-K, a dollar in saves us seven dollars at the back end, and the same thing goes. And who cares? Either way, anyway, as one of the people who came in and testified about that issue to our committee said, what are we here to do if we are not feeding our children? Why would we not feed our children? As a state and as a nation, we save money at the end of the day by taking care of our people. So, anyway, that's my very strong opinion, you might have noticed. Uh, <laughs> um, the Vermont uh, Superintendents Association um, Executive Director, interestingly, um, drew a parallel about where we are now. Um, the governor's call rallying the troops to give our state's children a world-class education. Um, with America's successful initiative over four de decades ago, to send a man to the moon. The good like news is, to to okay, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. Anyway, I can talk a little more. I mean, basically, um, 
Anyway, here's where we are. We've done the, I come from the private sector. I have a background in, I was the partner in charge of a leading brand identity and corporate identity firm in New York City. And the long and the short of it is, I, I get product development, I get product launches, and I think there's a good metaphor there, which is we've done the research. We have reports in the Agency of Education up to here. Now we've we've done the listening, we've done the focus groups, we've built some, we've built consensus among our top educational policy leaders. So now what we need to do is we need to just go out and do it. The governor gets it. I think all of you get it. Now all we need to do is design the product. And this is the thing. And this will be this is my absolute conclusion. I swear, the big thing we need to do is a couple of things that are really important. We need better data collection systems. We need to make some systems improvements in the way we deliver education. And at the end of the day, that will save us money. Thank you, and many thanks to all of you. Stay in touch. Mike Hubert. Thank you. Uh, I represent Wilford and Vernon. Kind of diverse communities. Uh, but before I start, I just want to take a moment to remember Bob Gannett, who gave me some of my best political advice ever. Some of it being, remember, no one's ever complained that a speech is too short. So I will be brief. Uh, I'm on the House Energy Natural Resources, Natural Resources and Energy Committee. And uh, this year, we're looking at thermal efficiency. Uh, that's one of our top priorities. Uh, currently, we're working on a land use bill, which is a revisitation of Act 200, Act 250. Um, it seems that we're beginning to open a can of worms. I'm hearing from everyone that's ever had an issue with Act 250, and just about every sportsman in the state of Vermont who thinks that he's subs he or she is subsidizing the tax bill for some landowner, therefore, should have access to their land. So this is going to be an interesting bill. The chair of my committee assumes that we'll be taking this up for at least a year, if not two. Um, so it is interesting and sometimes amusing on that one. Um, we've also been getting a lot of testimony about LIHEAP and weatherization. Under, under weatherization, <coughs> it kind of ties in with what we're doing with the um, thermal efficiency. The task force on thermal efficiency came up with some recommendations. Um, and as, as you hear throughout the day, you're going to find out that all that we're doing, while noble and good, is really expensive. And we're, we don't know how we're going to pay for it. In thermal efficiency, uh, there's a goal to weatherize 80,000 homes in Vermont. Um, we are not anywhere near meeting that goal. Um, and in looking at that and the recommendations, it has a very expensive price tag for the individual to get the money, the financing for that, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of $800 million in borrowing over the next seven years. Uh, and for the state, it's about $260 million in funding to fund that program. So what, what we've been looking at um, are a myriad of taxing sources. Uh, one of the front runners is um, a tax on home heating fuels would be, a, would be uh, an excise tax on home heating fuels. We're not sure what that number would be. Uh, but I, for one, think that if you're going to do that, you're going to, it's going to be punitive to the most vulnerable people. So I'm, I don't think I can support that. And also, um, if it's an excise tax, if it's a sales tax, our schools, our hospitals, and uh, our town halls would be exempt. But if it's not, if it's an excise tax, our schools would have to pay that extra bill. And I think, as you know, our schools are expensive enough already. Um, I really want to thank the Chamber for having us here today. Um, I know you're always asking us to come and so pleased that we come. This is a great opportunity for us to come and visit with you. And I sometimes think this is reversed. We should be hearing what you have to say. And, and, uh, that's what I would rather do. So thank you to River Valley, the Richards Group, and the <coughs> Chamber for having us here. And by all means, I'll stay after anybody wants to talk about thermal efficiency or anything else. 
I want to hear from you more than you need to hear from me. my time jeans and keep my hands still um, so I serve on the house ag committee I'm obviously the newest member of the Wyndham County delegation so part of the first month is really the learning curve trying to get to know as many of uh, the names and faces as I can to make sure I'm up to speed on the overall process uh, I'm lucky enough to serve uh, in Carolyn Partridge's committee she's the chair of the house ag committee and uh, is going to be a great mentor for me as I get settled in um, over the last couple of years, the House Ag Committee and, and the rest of the legislature uh, really did some pretty innovative work around a, a strategic farm to plate initiative that was tied in as an economic development strategy for the state. And then last year created the Working Landscapes Enterprise Fund, which was designed to give uh, resources to, uh, to the growth and the, the economic development opportunities in that sector. Um, in the early going, our committee has been hearing uh, sort of two major reports outcomes from those two processes. Uh, one, it was a, uh, just last week actually, and uh, this was a joint hearing uh, with the Education Committee, Valerie was there as well, uh, looking at aligning our education system to help deliver trained employees into sectors in the ag economy, ag food economy that are actually growing. Uh, some with excellent paying jobs, some with more uh, entry level jobs, so it's not, you know, it's a, it's a range, uh, but there are opportunities there, and the early data suggests that over the last couple of years, this sector has grown uh, by several hundred jobs, uh, but the formal data hasn't been announced yet. And then the second part of it is that the Working Landscape Enterprise uh, Board is now having to filter down 200 plus applications for grant money. There was uh, 1.1 or 1.2 million allocated last year, there's 950 thousand left after they set up the program uh, to give out in grants this year. The governor has put a request in for one and a half million in his budget for next year. So 200 plus uh, grant applications for more than $10 million in asks for a $950,000 grant fund. Uh, the good news is there's an incredible amount of entrepreneurial energy, creative energy around food and ag opportunities. Uh, I'm glad I'm not on that board. That's gonna be some tough decision making, but it shows the richness that's happening in that sector. Uh, moving forward for us. Um, looks like uh, one of the sort of big pieces of work that our committee will do is over the next four to six weeks, we're gonna be taking testimony on the genetically engineered labeling law, genetically engineered food labeling law. That was uh, last year a very controversial issue, uh, and um, it's come back to our committee because at the end of the biennium, if it doesn't pass, uh, the bill dies. So it's been reintroduced and we will be dealing with that. So if that's an, of, of interest to you uh, one way or the other, uh, know that that committee will be uh, working on that pretty substantively. And then finally, uh, I've done uh, not a lot of introducing of legislation as a, as a new person up there, but I have introduced a couple of pieces that are relevant. Uh, one, and the details will be fleshed out, um, introduced a uh, appropriations request for funding the Southern Vermont Business Accelerator. Uh, Jeff Lewis can talk more substantively about that, but there it was an idea that was proposed that didn't get into the budget, and we're going to work to try to raise awareness of that. That has to do with um, creating a you know post BY strategy, economic development strategy, aligning with the Seven's work in the Battler area, the Wyndham County area. And then I also, on the climate change issue that Molly mentioned, um, actually introduced a piece of legislation that would create an annual scorecard for four business sectors in the state. Uh, that would be using existing data sets, trade associations, and it would be just a simple metric for sort of assessing where we are in the present moment and what we think the risk is to key industries. That's ski, snowmobiling, maple, and commercial orcharding, which are four business sectors <coughs> that are kind of cross-cutting culturally, uh, kind of iconic industries in the state, um, and are already feeling very profound effects from uh, what they think we believe is the climate change effect, early climate change effects, and are having to make long-term business strategy decisions around what uh, the future will look like. And so what I'm hoping we can do is to work with those associations and sort of say annually, well, where do we think we are now? And where do we think we're gonna be in 20 years or 10 years? And, and what's the risk to the Vermont sort of 
overall economy and sort of our iconic status um, around these key industries. So those are some of the issues that I'm working on, and I can't wait to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Good morning. <laughs> Representative John Moran from Warsaw and all the other towns you heard about. Uh, first of all, I, I, I really support the administration's focus on uh, improving the infrastructure, whether it's roads and bridges, whether it's the uh, telecommunications, and uh, also early childhood education. The only issue I have is using your income tax credit as a funding source, so we'll have to look at that. At my level, I'm the vice chair of the General Housing and Military Affairs Committee, and so um, under military affairs, we're focusing on vetting the next candidate, uh, the candidates for the Adjutant General. We'll have an election in a couple weeks, and I'll, we'll have a public hearing, a uh, committee hearing to vote for candidates for that office. In housing, of course, we're looking at the perennial issues of affordable housing, housing, workforce housing, and the issue of homelessness. And so we've taken a lot of testimony on that and are working that. Uh, on the general portion of my committee, probably the one thing I'm most excited about what we're working on is H99. 50 years ago, President Kennedy passed the Equal Pay uh, uh, Law to mandate equal pay for women and men. Uh, Vermont is one of the better states, but still we have a status of 84% is of uh, women make 84% of what men do for a company, uh, uh, comparable jobs. So what we're looking at is H99, which is a bill that will uh, uh, mandate equal pay for women, unless of course there's business reasons for inequity in pay like seniority, you know, training, whatever. But basically, unless you can establish the fact that there's some reason for not paying equal pay, equal pay would be the rule. And we're also looking at, under that, flexible working conditions. Because in the Kennedy's era, obviously, there was a simple divide. There was the wage earner and there was the home caretaker. That time has changed over the 50 years, as you know. And so work and home life are intertwined in terms of people taking on responsibilities on both sides of that. So we're looking at workable flex uh, schedules in the workplace that it's, it, you have to offer, you have to listen to offers to ask for work, flexible work schedules. You don't have to necessarily accommodate them, but you ask, at least have to listen to them and accommodate as much as you can. And also we have a process of the freedom for people to share information with each other. It's almost do ask and do tell. And what I'm saying is you, you're allowed to share with other people your salary and you're allowed to ask other people their salary. It doesn't mean you, they have to tell you, but basically, you're allowed to do that. And all of these provisions I've talked about, there will be no uh, uh, no uh, re uh, com um, retaliation in case anybody exercises any of these laws. And in the final part of this law, we'll look at a study committee to look at family, pay family leave. And so I look forward to this bill moving forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. I represent, just to refresh your memory, Newfane, Townsend, and Marlboro. Uh, I've been on House Judiciary for 10 years, and I'm back on it again, which apparently means either they like what I'm doing or they couldn't find anybody else. Um, I also chair a joint House Senate committee called the Legislative Committee on Administrative Rules, which is certainly a mouthful. Uh, we use all the departmental and agency rules to make sure they're consistent with statute and are not arbitrary and a number of other legal standards, but basically we're the last legislative safety check to make sure that the various rules, which can be a great complexity, we just had one this week that was about that thick, um, that they are not uh, in some fashion either intentionally or inadvertently doing an end run around the legislature's statutory intent in authorizing those rules to be made because once rules are put in place, they have the effective statute to control people rather than comprehensively. So I'm going to talk since I have no idea what we're going to get in administrative rules until our agenda comes out every week uh, because we're a creature of whatever is filed with us. I'll talk mostly about judiciary. Um, I guess every every biennium has sort of a theme for us. A couple of years ago, we did uh, uh, very very extensive work for the best part of the biennium on totally helping reorganize the entire Vermont judiciary and making it a much more rational operation and a much more cost-effective one. Uh, as I was looking at what we were going to be facing this year in December and early January, and I started reading all the newspaper articles about the upcoming session, I started seeing a large circle of arrows 
all pointing at my committee, and they all seemed to revolve around things that had more of a social policy uh, flavor to them. Uh, we've got a couple of bills that we've already worked on uh, that started out in our committee, but we also do an awful lot of work in conjunction with other committees where they perhaps do more of the policy or specialized end that they have within their jurisdiction, and then the Judiciary Committee uh, looks at it from a constitutional and legal perspective and does that end of the bill. We're going to have a number of those this year. We've already, uh, in our committee, started on a bill and taken extensive testimony and done quite a bit of redrafting uh, to address uh, a very unfortunate situation with the state trooper who was falsifying timesheets which both affected his compensation and also affected uh, his pension, and which also obviously affected uh, public faith in law enforcement, which uh, unfortunately, when you have an incident like that, uh, it raises questions about everyone, uh, very unfairly for the other people. Uh, we are looking at a bill which would say essentially, if you commit at the moment a financial crime, although I think we'll broaden it to other uh, what I'll call betrayals of public trust, uh, you would be subject to potential use of your pension uh, provided by the state for either reimbursement of those you harmed by your criminal activity uh, and also for potential forfeiture of the pension. So we've spent quite a bit of work on that one. We also are working and have taken a lot of testimony on a so-called Good Samaritan Act that essentially is designed to ensure that if someone is in a drug abuse situation and is suffering life-threatening reactions, uh, they or the people who are with them can call law enforcement, can call rescue, and get the person into a life-saving uh, rescue <coughs> without being concerned that the immediate consequences that they and everyone around them is gonna get arrested. What it does essentially is says if you call in a life-threatening situation, law enforcement will not be able to use the um, materials or knowledge that they obtain through that call directly for purposes of prosecuting. And we had some actually very moving testimony. Uh, one of them was, uh, one piece was from a young woman who literally uh, not only would not um, uh, let law enforcement be contacted, although it eventually was, but she actually was refusing even to tell the EMTs and the ambulances they were trying to get her to the hospital what she paid for the year that she'd be arrested for. Uh, and the bill quite simply puts life above the uh, possibility of immediate arrest. It doesn't prevent law enforcement that has other independent evidence from pursuing it, but they can't use evidence they uh, come across simply because of that emergency call. Um, a bunch of other bills that are going to come our way, uh, one way or another, if, uh, in some cases, assuming they get through the Senate if they start over there. I'm just going to tick them off very quickly because they're all very involved and have any number of policy questions, and if you're interested, you can ask about them afterwards. Uh, the End of Life Bill, uh, also known as Death with Dignity, also known as Physician Assisted Suicide, depending on which side you're on. That is starting out in the Senate. It's made it through one committee. It's going to, I believe, receive a negative vote in the Senate Judiciary Committee, but it has been promised to go to the floor. And we'll see whether the Senate passes it and sends it our way. If it does, it will undoubtedly end up in my committee at uh, some stage for the legal and uh, constitutional analysis. Marijuana decriminalization, uh, likewise, will end up in front of us at some stage. Uh, that bill does not legalize marijuana, it simply takes it from a uh, fairly, for low, low level offenses, it takes it from a, um, a low level criminal fine to a civil fine. Uh, from my perspective, that avoids a lot of the very unfortunate consequences when somebody pleads um, to a low-end criminal violation and suddenly finds out that they can't qualify later on for student loans or housing or any number of other uh, things that are really disproportionate to the, to the crime. Uh, GMO labeling was mentioned, I'm sure that'll come to us. Uh, the alien driver's license bill, I'm sure will come to us, and campaign finance uh, and PAC regulation will also be in front of us. And then finally, uh, as a cleanup, moving back to things that we are primarily responsible for, we have for a number of years had a heavy focus on highway traffic safety. Um, we have passed several times uh, bills to prohibit use of cell phones while driving, uh, to eliminate the people who drive 45 miles down the freeway on the shoulder because they're on the phone. Um, 
We have tried a number of times to get primary seat belts. Uh, we easily get it through the House. It hits a roadblock in the Senate. We hope that won't happen again. We've worked a lot on DUI enforcement, uh, ignition interlock, uh, with the theory that what we want to do is get people not to drive drunk a second time. And ignition interlock really helps with that. And then finally, we've been wrestling for years with how to cut down on the repeat driving while suspended problem where people get a suspension, so then for criminal violations, then for a ticket, and then keep driving to get the money to pay the ticket, get a second suspension, and they're into the group. I've seen them as high as 17 driving while suspended, and it's just an untenable situation. And we're working very hard to find alternatives to ensure that people pay penalties, uh, but that they also don't get caught in this loop for the rest of their life. So that's a wrap on that. Uh, I think we have equal time with the House, naturally, so Gina, uh, you and I will divide our 15 minutes here, if that's all right. Uh, let me simply uh, begin by saying that my approach to economic development, which remains at the center of my concerns, is that Vermont is not going to be able to compete as a low-tax state. It's not going to be able to compete by despoiling our environment. The way we're going to be compete is by playing to our strengths. And what are our strengths? It is the high quality of our environment. It is the high quality of the services. It's that we are a low crime state and that we have a great sense of community. And that is the approach that I take. Um, and uh, where we can strengthen it, like bringing broadband and uh, cell phone access uh, throughout the state, we improving our infrastructure. I think that is uh, one of the critically important things we can do. I think thanks to legislation we passed two years ago, uh, as well as <coughs> federal funding, we should actually have broadband access throughout Wyndham County by the end of 2013. Uh, and with regard to Representative Merrick's bill to ban use of cell phones while driving, uh, my first thought is that we should have the cell phone coverage before we ban it. <laughs> now, I serve on the uh, Natural Resources and Finance Committees, uh, and I think I'm the only member, well, I know I'm the only member from Wyndham County on the, on the committee that actually pays for things, so that might make me a bit unpopular. But let me first address the Natural Resource Committee. Uh, we are addressing two issues. Uh, uh, one is whether there should be a moratorium <coughs> or a different regime that would govern uh, mountaintop industrial scale wind turbines in the state of Vermont. It is a controversial issue. What I can tell you is that it will come out of the Natural Resources Committee uh, because the majority of the members support it. What happens on the floor of the Senate, I don't know. Uh, and I'll be happy to discuss it in the Q&A period. The second issue that we're going to address is thermal efficiency, efficiency uh, which uh, uh, Mike uh, discussed. Uh, the, it, we, I think we all agree that electricity contributes almost nothing to our carbon footprint, and that's a real issue. Why should we despoil our mountains to do something that, uh, in fact, is making no difference to global warming? What actually makes a huge difference to our carbon footprint is our inefficient use of uh, uh, heating. Uh, and the best form of renewable energy is the energy you don't use. It's conservation. And so I think there's a consensus about that. Uh, the question is, how can we improve thermal efficiency uh, and how to pay for it? There are two, two basic approaches. One is that the state should be giving grants or incentives the problem with that as a matter of equity is that if you, do, if, if you have insulated your home, you are in effect subsidizing somebody who doesn't. And therefore, my preference is for a revolving loan fund uh, as an approach. Uh, the, but all of this comes back to the Finance Committee, which is how you pay for the things that we're going to do. With regard to thermal efficiency, Mike has discussed a, an excise tax on heating fuel, the governor has proposed a tax on break-open tickets. Everybody know what break-open tickets are? <laughs> right. Break them open. 
Uh, this is a form of, of um, gambling that turns out to be quite common. Uh, and the governor believes it can raise $18 million, which uh, uh, with a 10% uh, excise fee, uh, he estimates that, the, that $225 million is spent in the state on these things. I think that's very unrealistic uh, because uh, I don't believe that it would mean that every man, woman, and child in Vermont spent $375 uh, on something that I gather most people in this room don't even know what they are. So, in fact, if you think that a, a hundred thousand families do it, would be several thousand dollars per. So I think we're going to have to find a more realistic source of revenue for that. The second issue uh, that's going to be before us is the gas tax, already mentioned by Molly. Uh, the question is whether we clearly need to generate more revenue. The gas tax, a, a tax on gasoline, I shouldn't say gas tax, is the way you do it. The advantage of a per gallon tax is it is a tax on, it, it is a tax that encourages fuel efficiency. Part of the reason that revenues are declining is that we are having reduced, we're having greater fuel efficiency. Uh, the governor's proposal is to lower the gas tax, increase the sales tax. The disadvantage of the sales tax is that when prices are high, it accentuates the pain. When prices are low, it reduces the revenue to the state. Uh, the third issue uh, that we're going to address is the earned income tax credit. The governor has proposed, as uh, Representative Stewart pointed out, uh, a, uh, 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 that there should be a universal early childhood education in the state, and he has proposed to pay for subsidies to do it for low and middle income Vermonters by taking away the earned income tax credit or reducing it by two thirds. Um, it is a, in effect, a since it's on the income tax, it is a broad based income tax increase on lower income Vermonters. I have reservations about doing that uh, because also it penalizes certain categories of Vermonters, namely, for example, a couple that chooses, where one parent chooses to stay at home with the child, they would lose a benefit in favor of those who send their, their children off to uh, uh, preschool. Uh, it also would, it, it, it would channel the money to people with children under five as opposed to people who have children now uh, that are in, in higher grades in school. So if we're going to do this, my view is that we need to find another source of revenue. And finally, uh, and one always uses finally in talks because it gives your audience hope, <laughs> uh, especially at this stage. There's a line for you, Representative Stewart. When we have a different today. We have um, the question of how we're going to pay for our health care system. We got a report from the governor. The law had required the governor to uh, present a plan. Uh, the governor chose not to present a plan, but to, uh, and I think this has produced, in my view, some justifiable complaints from the Republican side. Uh, but uh, his argument for not doing it is that the plan couldn't go into effect until 2017, so we need more time. But the reality is if you, that the plan did present the options. And if you look at the options, there's the plan, because there is literally no feasible alternative that will raise sufficient money for the uh, single payer health care system other than a payroll tax of 10 or 11 percent along with an element of income tax which would be probably 3 percent, 3 percent on everybody. That is the way you raise enough revenue. There's no other possibility. And so the question that I think we need to hear from, from you who have businesses, uh, is what is your view of that, and should we in fact proceed? I will say from the point of view of business, if you're a business that already provides health care, in fact, that might end up saving you money uh, because you won't be paying the premiums. Uh, the income tax component is necessary simply because you can't have freeloaders on the system, people who uh, don't, uh, uh, who, who are not uh, earning uh, who are not, don't have earned income, but who have unearned income. Anyhow, <clears throat> these are the issues that we're addressing in finance. 
uh, and I can see, uh, yield my remaining 20 minutes to the uh, senior center from William County. <laughs> just about to begin my sixth term. I don't know where all that time went. I, I chair government operations and I serve on judiciary. So I just want to touch on a couple things because we never talk about what we did that might be affecting the lives of people. So I just want to comment on three things that we did last year that were, I believe, successes. One was a public records, um, cleanup of the public records law and um, we've been told by Vermont League of Cities and Towns, the Vermont um, Press Association, and the ACLU that it works. So if we can get all those to agree, we must have done something wrong. Right. <laughs> 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 yeah, right. What we um, do need to clean up is um, the issue around public records for criminal investigations. That's still a hot topic and I serve on judiciary and government operations, so both committees are dealing with it. The other one is something that um, Dick Merrick mentioned about um, driving with suspended licenses. There are 24,000 Vermonters driving with suspended licenses, not because of criminal activities, but because they couldn't pay a fine. That they're only, I mean, they, they were speeding to begin with or something, but they, it's not a criminal issue. So what we did last year is passed a bill that said they can enter into a, um, contract with the diversion board and their fines will be reduced if they need to given a, their economic situation and um, they'll get their license back immediately and as long as they're um, abiding by that contract they can drive legally. They sent out about 2,000 letters inviting people to come and so far people are flowing into the system to do that because people want to be able to drive legally. The other one is an expungement bill. If you were caught in the, I don't know how many of you know who Paul Lawrence was, the kind of infamous um, cop in the, state cop in the 70s who was doing stings and um, arresting people, planting evidence, little bags of marijuana here and there. His arrest record was really high, but most of them um, were illegitimate. And so if you got caught in that, or even if you legitimately got um, arrested, and now you've got grandchildren and you want to go on their school trip. Uh-uh, you can't do it because you've got a criminal record. So what we did is pass a bill that said you could apply for an expungement of that record. And so far we've had about 20, 25 people who've taken advantage of that and have had their records expunged. So this year what we're going to do is we're finally going to pass campaign finance reform. We are dividing it into two sections because I think there will be um, pretty unanimous agreement on the what we're going to do around the influence of PACs and super PACs on our elections and how we want to control that in Vermont. We're going to relook at the elections. Um, Cindy just turned over my thing that said, shut up. Um, <laughs> we're looking at how to reduce the prison population. We're working really hard on that again. and. I just want to mention lastly, finally, that um, we, my committee, I am on judiciary, and tomorrow we will take up, I believe it's tomorrow, we will take up the patient choice at end of life. That's what I'm calling it. I'm not calling it death with dignity or assisted suicide, but patient choice. And I don't know if it'll pass the Senate. It will come out of our committee um, on, probably on an adverse vote but I'm hoping that it will pass the Senate and get to the House. Um, I know there's a lot of interest in that bill on both sides. We had a public hearing the other night and it was very respectful on both sides. So that's it, thanks. Thank you. On the transport, uh, transportation funding, current taxes and planned changes for taxes, is all that money funneled into transportation improvement or is a portion of it uh, allocated elsewhere?
Okay, to you. Uh, you mean of the 19 cents, the current? Yep. Uh, we set up a few years ago the, the Transportation Infrastructure Bond Fund, which is uh, a, a flat rate on the retail price of gas and a percentage of diesel. And that money specifically goes into the Transportation Infrastructure Bond Fund for uh, long-term projects, specifically for bonding. The rest of the money I, some of it, I believe, goes, a little bit percentage goes to the education fund. It's, uh, it's distributed, most of it goes into the transportation fund, but it's, and I can't give you that, I'm sorry, I can't give you the exact percentage. It's a, like a fraction goes to the ed fund, and I'm sorry, but I can't totally answer it, but most of it goes into transportation. But the specific uh, extra money that we did a few years ago does go into a specific fund for bonding long-term transportation projects. And, oh, I know, I, I just remembered. Uh, about 25, 27,000 of it goes into the state police to fund there because they use the roads. And that's sort of been a, a little bit of a, you know, controversial, you know, this whole sort of rating of the transportation fund that some people perceive it. And I think we're gonna be having conversations about, about you know, what's an appropriate amount of money for that. So basically it goes into transportation-related, uh, most of it, goes into transportation related issues, except for a small portion that goes into the end fund. Thank you. And if you want specific numbers, I can get them for you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Ah. Right. I was too shy to introduce myself. Uh, I'm on the board of seniors, I'm Maria Walker. I'm on the board of Senior Solutions and the Gathering Place, and one subject that wasn't mentioned today is elders. I understand childhood education, you put money there and it pays off in the future. You put money behind elders and you get death with dignity, which is just fine. Uh, but there are real needs, and part of it is because the baby boomers are getting older, part of it is because of the poverty in the state at the gathering place in particular our cost per uh, a daycare person there is exceeding uh, what our payment is and that's because of the sliding scale we have to use so i hope uh, us elders because i'm also an elder uh, gets full attention it's it's a growing population unfortunately I'm hearing throughout these reports is that there's a lack of uh, money needed to do a lot of things. And my question is, what is being done to create jobs in Vermont, uh, returning uh, uh, children to come back to the state and to create employment here? Because it seems like if we have more jobs, that could create more revenue as well. So Senator uh, Galbraith, is there anything being done, not only to keep Vermont pristine, but to actually build a more vibrant Th thank you. That, that is an absolutely central question. The problem uh, is the, the ability of the state to influence it in a multi-trillion dollar national economy is finite. Uh, and but there are some things we can do. Again, uh, my belief is that we, we, we play to our strengths. Uh, why do people want to live in, nobody is going to come to Vermont because it's got a favorable tax system. Even if we cut our taxes in half, they would be high as compared to New Hampshire or Southern states. Uh, nobody's gonna come here because of the urban setting or the large labor pool. Uh, so they're going to come here for some very specific reasons, and much of it relates to quality of life uh, and the, the fact that low, low crime, uh, health, and, and maybe the specific, some specific industries. 
And so let, let's play to our strengths. One of the areas where I think we can make a huge difference is one I've put a lot of effort in, is broadband and uh, cell phone coverage. In the 21st century, people, professionals, do not need to be in any particular place to do their work. They can be any place in the world. They can live here and do editing or, or do the kind of work that you do, I think, uh, at least a lot of it. Uh, but they need to have 21st century technology. And if that's not available, then they can't do it here. And I know talking to realtors that houses without uh, broadband sell for 20% less than houses in areas that have it. So that's a, that is an important thing. There is a question about uh, education and, and, and trying to get more people to do science, technology, uh, engineering, and math, and STEM. Uh, that probably is worth doing, but I think we need to think a little more carefully about how we approach our, our young people. It would be great if young people who, who came here, went to our excellent schools, decided to stay in Vermont. But we are never going to compete with the opportunities that might exist for them in large urban areas. Uh, I, mean, I, I could never have been a diplomat if I'd stayed in Vermont. So if young people go and do something else and have great lives and then come back, that's also a good thing. And we can also be looking to attract people here. So uh, these are all, all things we can do. Uh, I will say on the tax code, and again, state taxes are fairly marginal as compared to federal taxes. I think that we do need to look at the que at, at question of, of, of some kinds of tax reform, including whether we might be able to lower the rates by eliminating deductions on state taxes that basically have, have no impact on behavior. That is a question, uh, if, for example, the whole mortgage interest deduction. That's a big deal on your federal tax. It's very minor on your state tax. So might you be better off with a lower rate and not having that uh, deduction? That's possible. Anyhow, that's one of the issues that we can do because I think our very high marginal rates may scare off some businesses. Jim, can I respond? Can I just say one thing about that? Thanks. One of the things that we are um, looking at that I didn't mention is we, we currently have um, VEDA, Vermont Economic Development Authority, and they <coughs> loan money to businesses. What we're looking at is, um, we, we've kind of avoided using the word state bank, but that in fact is what we're looking at. Is the, and our committee will have that next week, the ability to put more of our money into VITA or a similar organization to be able to generate more money. We apparently pay about $70 million to TD North to um, in interest for holding our bonds and for investing our money. That $70 million could, some of that money could be invested in a Vermont organization, which then would make more money to put toward the Working Landscape Fund, other VITA um, programs, and some of our venture capital entrepreneurial programs. Molly, you wanted to add something? <coughs> I want to talk about two other things. One is a, a, something that Tristan referenced is the Working Lands Enterprise Investment uh, Board. And I was a sponsor of that bill last year. And the whole, it literally is a job creation bill. It's to, again, what Senator Galbraith said is to uh, build on our strengths. It's to grow and give money to entrepreneurs in the agriculture, forestry, and value-added products uh, sectors. And it's starting small. There's 1.5 million this year allocated. But I know there are a lot of young people in this state who want to farm or they want to do value-added products. And uh, for example, up in Hardwick, they created the, and this money would also go to creating sort of for infrastructure for businesses, creating the food venture center in Hardwick. So sort of shared kitchen space where people can create products. So, if we're thinking about Vermont and what makes Vermont, that also keeps our working lands in productive use. If we can use the um, products of the ag and forest industries, it keeps the land open for, and that which helps our tourism industry. And then the other issue is the arts. And this year's budget, the governor has uh, put in a couple hundred thousand more to the Vermont Arts Council, which means that we will not be leaving 
federal uh, National Endowment for the Arts money in Washington. That was very critical. The NEA said, we're not going to match with in-kind. We need actual state dollars. And uh, Doug Hoffer, who's our new auditor, had did a study a couple years ago that said the arts were actually like number five in terms of, of the you know jobs created in the state. So I think we need to look at things that seem to be a little bit you know marginal, but actually all taken all together really can create the kind of Vermont that we want and and create small scale kind of enterprises. Thank you. Thank you. Mike, you want to throw in? Thank you. And, and one, one of the things that we have to remember is businesses that now exist in Vermont. How do we keep them here? And that comes before my committee all the time when we talk about energy costs. The costs of the energy here in Vermont are very high. And uh, places like IBM come and talk to us that, about that all the time. And again, we have down in my town an energy source. Um, and we're always talking about low carbon, base load, and that provides it. Um, but what I want to talk about also is other businesses in the area that may run into difficulties because the legislature has done something that had an unintended consequence. And we have a business here in Brattleboro, and I want to commend the rest of the delegation. When, when I found out about the business and I went to the rest of the Wyndham County delegation, everyone signed on to help this company. It's located here in Brattleboro. It's called ROV, it's Robotics of Vermont. And they build robots to go into hazardous environments and uh, we joined the Texas Compact, and there was a couple of quirks there that need fixing, so I filed some legislation to do that, and I must tell you, I am very pleased, while I'm the minority member of the, of the delegation, very pleased to tell you the delegation worked very hard uh, in addressing issues of local business and how we can assist them. So if you do have any issues with your business, if you're having problems with the state, please contact us, because our local businesses are as important or more important than bringing in a new business. We have, we have to maintain what we have, and we're making it more and more difficult for the people here now to do business. So if you have difficulties, please let us know. Valerie? And if I could just add a real quick comment, which is um, I was having dinner recently with someone who's the head of a business right here in Brattleboro and he would really like to expand his business by 50 people. And he was not the first company on the list for a certain space, which would have lasted, allowed him to expand. So the long and the short of it is, I mean, I'm really, earlier as you see, I'm quite exuberant about this town and what we're doing, on the one hand. On the other hand, it, you know, I don't know all the particulars, but it sounded pretty odd to me that, I mean, if you weigh how much he could generate with 50 jobs, versus how much the other entity, we shall say, uh, could generate. Um, it just, to me, it did not add up. And I just would like to always make sure, um, you know, I worked in the private sector for 14 years and I get it. It's like, you know, the scale. Okay, so 450K, these are 50K a year jobs times, uh, uh, you know. So I would really, just like to make sure that we're always using the right scale and we're actually really, really carefully analyzing and making sure that we give uh, the businesses that can do the most for our local, our little teeny local economy uh, first choice. We have time for one more question. Uh, yeah, Michael Bosworth, um, climate change has been mentioned a couple of times here. We know it's uh, real, I think most of us do. Uh, and Thermal Efficiency Task Force. So a question for uh, both Senator Dreblick and uh, Representative Hubert. Um, personally, you know, I'm aware of the Thermal Efficiency Task Force and the need to uh, weatherize and, and tighten up a lot more homes. It's a very good way to address climate change. So I'm not yet convinced that a revolving loan fund will, will be enough. So I would like more argument from Senator Galbraith that I'm, I'm open about. And uh, from uh, Representative Hebert, uh, what kind of uh, funding sources do you think there might be if, if people, if politically, people can't get behind a, 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 a you know a heating oil tax? So. Uh, inevitably, in a forum like this, you use a lot of shorthand. But the idea behind the revolving uh, loan fund would be something equivalent to the PACE program. 
the idea behind the PACE program is that, uh, well, let me just back up. Why would you not weatherize your home? Because over time, uh, it will have a payback. The an there, there are a couple of answers. Um, one is uh, that you don't have the money, the capital. So even though you're putting in 10000 over 10 years will pay itself back at $1,000 a year, you don't have the 10000 And the second reason you might not do it, even if you have the money, <coughs> is that you don't know if you're going to be in your home for 10 years. And uh, uh, thermal efficiency is a, 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 a hidden improvement that generally doesn't increase the value of your house or may not increase it sufficiently, so you're not going to get a return. So the idea behind the PACE program is that you would get a $10,000 uh, loan to do thermal efficiency. You would, uh, that would save you $1,000 a year, say, and then you would pay it back at $1,000 a year. So from a cash flow point of view, you are held harmless. Uh, and the, but the, the loan would attach to your property tax. So basically it would be a special assessment. Uh, and when you sold the house, then whoever bought it would pay that assessment uh, for the duration of the loan. Uh, so th this is the basic idea behind the revolving loan fund. And it should logically uh, hold, hold everybody harmless. There's another way to do it, which is the same idea, but to add it to your utility bill. Uh, there, there are some practical problems with the PACE program having to do with Fannie, uh, Fannie and Freddie uh, 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 and order of uh, loans and how much equity you need to have in your house. So that's, that's an alternative way to do it. But, but, but that is the basic idea. And then the question is how do you raise the money for the revolving loan fund? Again, I don't think the 10% the tax on each break open ticket is likely to raise the money that the governor says. So we will have to look at some other alternate source of revenue. Uh, uh, and I guess that will come to the finance committee. Mike Hebert, did you want to add to that? Yeah. Thank you, Senator Goldman. Um, you stole part of my thunder. I was going to go to the PACE program. It was something very positive that we did last year. And I think that that's an easier way to fund this sort of program. <laughs> Uh, one of the other things, as I mentioned earlier, we're talking about lie heap and weatherization. Um, there is also much to be gained financially from being a little more frugal in how we deal with lie heap. And if we would spend some money on weatherization in a lie heap program, we would realize great savings. Uh, one of the problems, and I don't know how many of you are landlords here, um, but one of the problems that we hear about is folks are either paying their own utility when they're renting and the landlord doesn't put a lot of money into energy efficiency so there's a lot of heat going out through the walls and and that's money that can be gained and put back into weatherization and on the other hand if you are the landlord and you drive by your tenants rental home and you see the windows are open but the heat's on or there's no snow on the roof, you also realize that there is a waste of energy there so the efficiency itself could help fund some of the weatherization, which would roll back into um, into programs that would lower the amount necessary to be raised in taxes or in other sources just by using efficiencies and uh, and dealing better with how we utilize energy and stop. Everyone knows the house in the neighborhood you drive by, there's no snow on the roof and that sort of thing. Uh, we have to look at that, and that, that would help us tremendously in where we're going with the funding and how much we need to spend in tax. Uh, but again, I think the single most, <coughs> Peter addressed it, is if we have something like a PACE program where people could actually afford to do those things, uh, over the long run, we would save fuel and save money. Thank you. I want to thank everybody for coming, all of our legislators. One of the benefits, I think, of this is not just the presence here, but the fact that people get to meet the legislator and uh, you know facilitate future discussions so I think uh, I want to thank all the legislators for coming, Molly Burke, Valerie Stewart, uh, Mike Hebert, Dick Merrick, John Moran, Kristen Antolino, Peter Galbraith, Janet White, how did I do? Um, thank you all for coming, and uh, we'll see you again at the next session. Sure.
another shout out to the Richards Group at River Valley Credit Union for helping this happen this morning, and of course to the Retreat for their usual wonderful hospitality. Um, and thanks again for all you all you do. You guys are here this morning, Jeanette, and everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Will we go for a legislator's photograph?